We're going to start out with the war in Ukraine. A fellow made some comments about that, and I thought uh, it'd be nice to put them up here. And here it goes. <clears throat> he says, China will win this war, and then they will turn their manufacturing on their own population. Whoa. Just as Napoleon and Hitler lost their wars because they stretched their armies along too many fronts, so too will the West lose this war as China readies to take Taiwan, North Korea readies to take the Philippines and Japan, and Iran readies to bomb Saudi Arabia. My God. This is why the West will end up losing this war they are pushing with Russia. Russia will take out Kiev as soon as the war hawks in Russia get rid of Putin. The West will do nothing. Man, I surely, sure would love to have this fellow's crystal ball. Eh? There you see uh, big Russia against little Ukraine. Took part of their territory there in the eastern part of Ukraine. And they're fighting not only NATO, which is the blue regions there, but also the green regions, which now are blue, you could say. They're part of NATO. And that includes the United States, which is not on the map there. Okay. Meanwhile, Russia is essentially on its own. Okay. So that's the situation there. And this fellow con uh, continues, and here, let me put this up here, give me a second. He says the following, he says, um, China will take Taiwan and the West will be able to do nothing about it. Their war resources are already stretched too thin. It will happen. The military uh, is against the politicians' war with Russia. Every single one of their models shows China will enter and the West will lose. Uh -huh. The West has reacted, uh, has reached the end of borrowing, and so the system is crashing, and they want to create a new Bretton Woods to create a new monetary system and blame Russia for their default because they have stuffed their debt into uh, pensions, banks, and insurance institutions. Again, love to have this guy's crystal ball. Uh, my crystal ball says something a little bit different. Okay, that's all I can tell you right now. But let's move on. Here we have a professor at a university, and he says the following, okay? He went out in the news the other day and says, the U.S. support of Ukraine is more than moral and legal support based on said article, blah, blah, blah. U.S. action is based on self-interest to defeat Putin, to allow NATO expansion and to promote democracy. Also, we are testing weapons and equipment, our training in, our, in their use and the logistics of their supply. Our behavior is consistent with a long-held American strategy of what? forward defense and the promotion of democracy. To me, this forward strategy and promotion of democracy are not consistent with the development of a new world order of peace and mutual prosperity with China and Russia. Well, poor Professor Pfister got uh, mauled in the comments section by a lot of people when he wrote this article, okay? People didn't like it. And what can I tell you? You know, I, you know we're all born and we're raised and we're brainwashed uh, to believe in countries. We're all nationalists, essentially most of us at least, right? The great majority of us. We're, um, I guess you could call territorialists. Some people say we inherited that from, I guess the days of the Permian when uh, we had the mammal like uh, reptiles, you know, like the Metrodon and so on. And, you know, and Daphosaurus and some of these other animals. And we became territorialists. Okay, and so when you're born, you know, you're born in this country, you're taught the national anthem, you are asked to look at the flag, that's your flag, not the other one, that one is, is yours, and so we become territorialists, and there's a natural tendency for us monkeys, you know, we're social animals like all the other apes out there, and we tend to like our group, you know, and the other one, the group across the river, that's the enemy. You know what I mean? And so, so, you know, if people are asked to decide or choose, you know, one side, they usually choose the side that they're born in, the one that they've been brainwashed in. So we are all, in a sense, nationalistic. That's what they teach us. That's what most people succumb to. Okay, so we're all nationalistic. But let me put it in the right context here. Uh, we have two gangs. We have the South Side and we have the North Side gang. Chicago, late 1920s, uh, which one do you owe your allegiance to? Which one would you like to owe your allegiance to, the north side or the south side? And this is what I'm talking about here. You have uh, Mr. Al Capone and Bugs Moran. Bugs Moran ran the uh, north side and Al Capone the south side there. You can see the red and blue regions. They essentially governed, right, or controlled to, to a great extent. The... Uh, 
violet blue there or uh, purple uh, that's uh, kind of a no man's land there were bands to, uh, gangs there that sometimes cho you know switch sides back and forth but that's essentially their territory and so the question is are you going to wave your red flag or are you going to wave your blue flag which side are you going to choose you know it's here and my point here is that you know it's good not to choose sides in this war because they're all gangs that's all it is. It's just gang war. You have one gang that wants to overthrow the other gang, and this gang attacked a certain territory, and the other gang, you know, decides to defend it. It's just gangs. That's all it is. You know, uh, uh, you did not elect a government. You did not elect the politicians. Politicians are all, not elected, but selected. They are selected by the rich and powerful, and you get to vote for whichever one they put in front of you. And so uh, it's like you voted for Al Capone or Bugs Moran. You know, who do you like best? <laughs> okay, that's more or less the situation. So what can I tell you? Um, you're wasting your time if you choose sides, okay? Um, the best thing you can do, if you can manage it, if not everybody can manage it, is try to forget about your flag, your national anthem, your country, and, and just look at it objectively. What is it to you? How does it affect you personally? You know, and that's the best way to look at it. So it's very hard to detach yourself from all that, but that's that's the ideal. That's what you should strive for. It took me a long time to figure that out. <laughs> that's all I can tell you. Okay, so here we have Mr. Elon Musk. Some of you know him, okay? And this is what he has to say about China, something coming up, which is the uh, decline in population in China, okay? And he says the following, Elon Musk warns of massive danger looming over the world. China's recent announcement has the global CEO gravely worried. Musk calls population decline a, what? Massive danger, okay? This drop, which could continue until the end of the century, could severely harm the economy and the pension system. And you can see there the graph that I showed last time where you can see the decline in the birth rate, essentially, you know, year after year, it's coming down for China. A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't give a damn about what's going on in China. I mean, who cares? You know, that's the problem they have over there. I'm over here. I'm in a different gang. I'm, a, I'm in the north side, not in the south side. <laughs> okay, so I don't have to worry about China, right? Um, yeah, you do have to worry because there are implications from these uh, events that are happening on the other side of the universe, kind of, you know, the side of the world. Uh, we're all interconnected. We live in a very um, interconnected world uh, economically interconnected also military social and so on but more so economically we're all e economically interconnected and if china has problems uh that uh, such a big country as china one-fifth of the world population that's going to have an effect on you indirectly okay so uh just keep that in mind and yeah as you can see here uh there was a note recently china's population drop in six decades so sounds alarm on demographic crisis and again they're saying that china's population fell and so uh it is a topic that is lately coming into the news okay so just be aware of that that does affect you and you say well who cares about china after all you know india is still growing right and it turns out here's the uh numbers for india okay and you can see that their population is declining as well. In other words, it's growing, but the rate is falling, meaning at some point it's going to approach zero population growth. And so my crystal ball there says that they may not reach the end of the century, as it's shown there, 2095 to uh, 2100, right at the end. Now, I think uh, very soon we're going to meet extinction, maybe not as close as I show there. I don't know. I can't tell you. My crystal ball is not that crystal, okay? But I think uh, extinction is around the corner, and India will not reach that uh, the end of the century. No way. Um, so that's as far as India population. How about um, its economics? Well, here's economics for India. Ah, I lost it. Hold on. Give me a second here. Right on the other side. <clears throat> One more second. There we go. Okay, it says, global economic downturn has begun to affect India's trade says the incipient global recession has begun to affect India, and it goes through all the problems that India is having thanks to the global downturn. So not only do we have population growing at a slower rate, ever slower rate in India, but also its economics is being affected, and they have the other fifth of the world population in their country. Okay, So these are countries you got to pay attention to. 
Uh, do we stop there? No, here we have Pakistan, okay? Fifth uh, largest country in the world as far as population is concerned. And you can see their population is declining as well. Uh, not declining overall total, but uh, the rate is what's coming down, meaning it's, it's getting lower and lower and lower and lower as time goes by, and this leads to zero population growth. How is its uh, economics? Well, terrible. Pakistan's economy grinding to a halt as dollars dry up. Okay, so we're having problems over there in Pakistan, big country, and it says a shortage of crucial dollars has left banks refusing to issue new letters of credit for importers. And it goes on to say that they're having problems, a lot of stuff that is being left at the um, uh, ports uh, because they don't have any money to move it. Okay, so uh, all these countries are having big problems. And you might say, well, that's over there. But see, when you put them all together, they have probably at least half of the population on Earth. And if they're having problems, and you think that that's not going to affect you over here, well, think again. That has to have an effect on you because it is the fact that they are buying things and selling, obviously, right, that is moving the global economy around. And they don't buy because they don't have any money or they have some kind of economic problem. Uh, you don't sell. <laughs> if you don't sell, guess what's going to happen to the companies in the region where you live, like Europe or the United States especially? Well, they're going to have problems as well. All these countries need to sell. We live in an interconnected world economically. And if the other side doesn't buy, like China, India, and Pakistan, we don't sell. And I'll leave you to think about that, see if that rings a bell in your head. Here's a list of the most populous countries in the world and how they're faring. And you can see the yearly change there, the third line. You can see how um, all of them are relatively low very small percentages that you see there, uh, nothing like it used to be in the past where you had uh, double digits. Now that's no longer true. And the only two countries, Nigeria and Ethiopia, are the only countries that are above two. And even those are coming down. Why are they coming down? Well, I've told you this in the past. I don't know if it rings a, a bell or, or it entered your head at this point, but they're coming down because people are moving to the cities. Once you live in the cities, you cannot have children. It's pro prohibited. It's forbidden. You're not allowed to have children in the cities. It's, it's forbidden by law. <laughs> you can't have children in the cities because the culture changes, the economics changes. When you were in the country, yeah, we used to have our great grandfathers. We used to have lots of kids. Half of them died. Nobody cared. You know, you wouldn't even know the names of the people who, of the kids who died. And those that survived, well, those reproduced and they just kept going. That's not the case today case today is that we live in a service economy, a city economy, and um, you know people in the cities cannot have children. You can't have 10 children in an apartment. So this is the problem. And so you have peop uh, countries like China which said, well, we're going to stop this one child per family or two child per family law, and we're going to allow people to reproduce as much as they want. And still, pe uh, women especially, you know, they're, they're not reproducing, even with incentives. Uh, countries like Japan, Russia, they cannot get their women to reproduce children. That should make you stop and think. You know, I mean, they're bribing them to have children. They say, no, even with bribes, we will not have children. Okay, maybe one, you know, just to see what it looks like. Like, do we need it? No, we don't need it. But I'd like to see what a kid looks like. You know, that's, that's all it is. But no more 10 children per woman. You know, like one per year. That's gone. <laughs> That'll never happen again. Okay. And yeah, that'll lead us to zero population growth. Zero population growth leads to economic problems, economic consequences. It's not free. Okay, now we had uh, some people, they uh, met over here in Davos, and it's the rich and powerful, you know, and they flew their way to Davos, okay? And here you have John Kerry and Al Gore. They were two of the participants. Parallel to that, uh, you have Greta Thunberg. Uh, she came here and uh, to Germany and was arrested for uh, picketing, I guess, <laughs> a mine. She protested that the mine was being uh, re, re, reborn uh, to make up for the gas shortages from uh, Russia. You have people like Guy McPherson. <laughs> I like Guy because he cries all the time, you know, that the climate change is going to kill us. In fact, I think he gave a date like 2024, 2026, something like that, very close to our date, uh, that the climate is going to kill us all. That's the end of the world because of climate. All these people are climate change. They're, they're missing the boat completely. Climate change is not going to change anything uh, regarding extinction. It has no effect whatsoever on extinction. Climate change is happening. Yeah, it might take 100, 200, 300 years for all we know. 
Humanity is probably going to die a lot sooner than that. We're not going to last 100 years even. And whatever, 1%, 2%, 3%, change in our climate, temperature, higher, for example, right, is not going to do anything to wipe out humanity. It's going to be the economy. So forget about climate. But that's what these people have been discussing over here in Davos. Okay, here we have um, a fellow who says, incest doesn't cause genetic defects. Okay, that's good to know. And it says, it is important to keep in mind that even for an unrelated couple, there is an approximately 2 to 3% chance that their child is born with a defect, birth defect, genetic syndrome, or disability. That is because genetic disorders only come from what? Environmental factors and gene mutations, which can happen to anyone regardless of inbreeding. Well, this fellow um, is not uh, factoring uh, uh, something else. It's not that if you sleep with your mother, you know, that the child that comes out of that union is going to come out retarded or anything like that. It doesn't happen like in one generation. To look at this problem, you got to look at what I'm proposing, which is hundreds of thousands of years of inbreeding. That's a little different. I'm saying that, you know, when you inbreed for thousands of years, that has an effect. And that's the reason humans today have very, very little genetic diversity, okay, which is a fact. Fact in the sense that if you go out there and check every human out there, you'll find that we're all clones, essentially, you know, from a genetic point of view. You know, whoever you sleep with today is your brother or your sister from a genetic standpoint, okay? And here's an example, a very uh, famous example, which is Queen Victoria. You know, uh, all the kings and emperors of, in, of uh, Europe in uh, the uh, early part of the 20th century, uh, First World War, they were all descended pretty much from uh, Queen Victoria. Lots of them were, not all of them, but obviously a lot of them were. And so what's the issue? The issue is that, you know, a couple of them had problems. The famous case of Alex and Nikki, you know, in Russia, they were essentially cousins. They all, de they both descended from Queen Victoria, one way or another. And so, uh, and it's just an example, but you have another example, the uh, Habsburgs, you know, especially in Spain, uh, Charles II of Spain, okay, he was known as the Bewitched because he was born, you know, retarded. And he descended from a long line of Habsburg that intermarried, that inbred, right? And they all had the famous Habsburg chin, okay, which was, ooh, you know, <laughs> look him up and you'll find out. Since the uh, kings of Spain, um, uh, Isabel and Ferdinand, since that time, all the Phil Phillips, they were all Habsburgs, and they all married within the family. And so, you know, finally you end up in the 1700s with Charles II, and he was born in Wright. And that's when Spain went down the drain, really, in, in Charles II's reign. Uh, and you, you'll find other cases. And the other famous case is the case of the Amish. I bring it up constantly. You know, the Amish have been inbreeding for the last 350, 400 years in the States, Pennsylvania, Ohio, that region, you know. And today they're having problems. They're having genetic problems. And it's not uh, just by sheer coincidence, like this guy says, it's um, environmental. No, no, we've had uh, people who were born with these problems hundreds of years ago. As I showed in one of those pictures there, you saw these girls from the 1700s. They were born by the hip, uh, you know, uh, Siamese twins. And hopefully the environment did not, was not so polluted in those days to make them look like that. You know, that was a genetic disorder at the beginnings. And in fact, it happened earlier. I think uh, we already had cases in the 1200s, as far as I could trace it back, where, uh, where they already started having genetic problems. So, you know, genetics has nothing to do with the environment, or if anything, very little to do with the environment or with what you eat. It's got to do with the fact that we've been inbreeding for so long. I think if you would have come, uh, if you could <clears throat> tra uh, you know, travel in time, as they call it in general relativity, 50,000, 100,000 years ago, I don't think you would have found so many cases as we, as we find today, okay, proportionally. Okay, one fellow says, everything is tied to a cycle, okay, they, these people are cyclical, they believe in cycles, they think history repeats itself, the economy collapses in a cyclic fashion made worse by government interventions, and we survive, okay, thank God. <laughs> we survived in spite of government, he says. There was no money in the 1930s during the economic collapse, and what did people do? They created local script, meaning local currency, right? Money is a tool. We will not be so quick to throw it out just because the economy turns sour. And people don't seem to understand. What, what, what I'm telling them is that people will not voluntarily get rid of money 
is that money will cease to have value and people will recognize it as that and nobody will accept it. Therefore, if you have lots of money in your hand, you will not be able to give it out because nobody will accept it. Okay, because you can't do anything with it. And this person said, well, we'll create local script. Meaning, um, essentially, we're going to do bartering. And whether you use some currency is irrelevant. You can use some currency, monopoly money if you want, no problem. Do some exchanges with monopoly money, no problem. As long as everybody gives the monopoly money value, we're okay. You can trade gold if you want. Uh, or go back to the Stone Age, you know, when we used to weigh, uh, what is barley, and pay them with so many pounds of barley or salt or whatever. No problem. You, you can... You can agree to have any currency you want. <clears throat> what is the problem? The problem is what I see in all these movies, these end of the world movies. Uh, when that comes to mind is Waterworld, which I saw. And uh, this fellow goes to a fort. And here the people say, okay, here we are. And what no one ever says in any of these films is where does the food come from? Who is producing the food? Who is distributing the food that keeps everyone in the movie alive? Food is what the issue is, and no one even touches that subject at all. It's like, you know, we go uh, to the future and we find that after World War I, uh, three or whatever, World War IV, we have all these people living in whatever situation they're, they're in, and who produces the food? How does food grow? Where are we getting the food? And uh, it's like people pay very little attention to food because, you know, say, well, food I can get at the supermarket. I just go one or two blocks away and, and there's food, all the food I want. I can get potatoes, onions, whatever I want. Yeah, uh, right now. But if there is a world war, all that collapses. No one produces the food and distributes it, especially to the cities. You would have to go to the country. And if you go to the country, what you'll find is factories you know, that manufacture or that you know, process food. And they're not processing food because everybody's laid off. And you go to the farm and you don't find anyone there because it was all companies that ran all the farms, most of it at least, and they're not working either. So who produces the food? And you say, well, I'll produce my own food. Well, for city folks, first of all, you know, that's already a no-no. I mean, you can't plant potatoes on your carpet in your apartment. Okay, so that guy's out of the, out of the loop. But you can say, well, there are some farmers out there, uh, you know, and there are also people who, um, uh, you know, have land and they can produce something there. Even if they don't produce it today, they can produce it in the future. And the question is, why would they give it to you if it's the only thing keeping them alive? What do you give them? Give them the money. And you say, well, I'm going to barter. I'm going to give them my car and my boat and maybe maybe your wife or <laughs> get rid of it. Um, it doesn't work that way because after the collapse, the only thing of value is food. And there's no purpose in anyone trading food for food. You just keep whatever food you have. And the only thing you need to do is protect whatever food you have. So if you have a farm, you're growing food, well, you better be ready to protect that food. And how are you going to do that if you have thousands of hungry people coming from the city looking for food and they see your farm with all that corn, all that wheat, cows, pigs, chickens? Oh man, it's going to be a slaughter. And yeah, I don't know if you can defend that. Even if you kill half of them, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, the point is that all that food will be gone. So, you know, there won't be any bartering, any trading. It doesn't matter what money you create, what medium of exchange you create, what currency you create. So currency is irrelevant. Currency dies okay, completely. Nobody will accept money because the only thing of value will be food. Just imagine a hunter gatherer out there. Uh, Paleolithic, whatever, and he hunts a deer. Okay, so he kills a beer, deer, <laughs> beer. I, I hunt beer, but he kills a deer, and why would he trade it to you? What, what would you give him in exchange? Say, well, I've got pheasant, or I don't know, I got eagle, I got a rabbit. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh, the hunter hunts whatever he's going to eat. He doesn't trade what he ate, what he hunted, especially if he's got a family. So this notion that you're going to trade something, you're going to say, well, I'm, giving, I'm going to give him my spear. I'll give him my machine gun for, uh, for the deer. He'll just wait you out, let you die, and then he'll take the machine gun from you. I mean, he can go to the city and get all the machine guns he wants after everybody's dead. He can get all the shoes he wants, all the clothes he wants. He doesn't need your machine gun or your spear or whatever you want to offer him. The only thing of value after the world collapses, the world economy collapses, is food. And people have a trouble understanding that because they say food I can get in the supermarket yeah today not tomorrow okay that's the issue 
Okay, fellow says, fiat money is a type of currency that is not backed by a commodity such as gold. When fiat currency gets to the point of a wheelbarrow full of cash buys a loaf of bread, they just reset the currency. It happened over and over again. Yeah, because in the past, uh, we did this, and people think that, again, this is all cyclical, and history repeats itself. That's what they have in the back of their minds. A global reset of the fiat money system is possible. It's only belief of value that allows fiat currency to function. Yeah, that's very important what he said there. It's belief, okay? We won't be running out of inches either, okay? The value of currency is a barometer of people's trust in the government. If there is no trust, then you don't have money. So he's got a contradiction. He doesn't believe, he doesn't understand this. He said, we won't be running out of inches. Yeah, because inches does not depend on faith. Money does as he says here, belief of value, okay? If there is no trust, you know, in God we trust, then you don't have money. That's different than inches. So inches is a bad analogy for what's happening to money. He continues, he says, the U.S. retains its currency's value by ensuring that a good portion of world financial contracts are denominated in U.S. dollars. And he's totally right there. Uh, over 60% of the world currency is U.S. dollars. And so, you know, a lot of people do their contracts, especially international contracts, in dollars, and a lot of countries are now trying to switch away from that because they feel the United States is using that as a weapon against them. Okay? Continue says, no reason why there should, would be any global currency reset coming anytime soon. Okay, yeah, it's possible. Uh, um, I don't think we need a world reset like a global one. But in fact, today I read that Argentina and Brazil are trying to establish a currency between them because, again, they're worried that you know the dollar has too much of an influence over their economy. So they want to do a local currency, you know, what we just discussed. They want to do a local currency that just involves Argentina and Brazil. And of course, if that works, uh, they're probably going to expand it to other countries such as Paraguay, Uruguay, and other countries in the region. And that would push out the dollar. We have also the BRICS over there, you know, uh, all these countries that say they're going to be dealing with oil in BRICS currency. You have the Chinese trying to put the yuan, uh, push it, you know, uh, Russia is now uh, agreed to accept the yuan. And so little by little, they're kind of pushing the dollar out, like saying, you know, we don't want dollars because it's used as a weapon against us. So I think a lot of the contracts in the near future, at least, at least uh, will be changing and they'll be done in other currencies, which is not the dollar. We got to see what happens with that, right? Okay, here one fellow says, I was thinking about post-humanism, okay? AI, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, technology becomes advanced enough to replicate human consciousness. <laughs> well, I don't know. Okay, let's assume let's, we're making an assumption here, right? If humanity gets to that point, they should leave a picture of how human civilization was, at least. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I'm sure that the robots are going to worry about us once we're gone. You know, They're going to say, oh, these poor humans, they created us, but they left, and so we're going to write the history. For whom? For the future generation of robots? You know, I hope they have enough oil to, for their joints, you know? <laughs> The human wishes to be eternal, but it's a fact we ain't. It's sad. Well, you know, I like to say that what God envies in man is his mortality. Can you imagine living forever, not being able to die? You shoot yourself in the hand, you stab yourself in the heart, and you don't die? That's, that must be terrible. It must be worse than dying, being able to die. Now, people say, well, you know, I only got 80 years. That's so little. Well, if you compare yourself against some insects, they live a month or two months. Uh, you know, they have very, very extremely short lifespans measured in days. And here we've been given, you know, by Mother Nature, 80 years, 70, 80, 90 years, you know, to live in general, right? That's not bad. We're among the animals, because we are animals, that live a long time. You know, maybe not the ones that live, we probably don't live more than some of the turtles out there, Galapagos turtles or whatever, but uh, we live a long time. And so be, be grateful that Mother Nature has had pity on us, or she smiled on us and says, I'm going to allow you people to live 60, 70, 80 years, you know. That's not bad, uh, considering, you know, what's out there. Everybody would love to live 300, 400 years, maybe. I don't know. It'd be nice. But don't, don't complain so much. 80 years is not bad, 70, 80 years. I live 70, so I'm getting there. There, were, there has to be ways to hold human extinction back and save up some time. Um... You know, I think, again, Mother Nature is wiser than us. She knows when to kill us. And one of the problems here is that, you know, um, someone, 
listen carefully here because this this doesn't get into a lot of people's brains. I, I'm, I'm trying to get it in there, but people cannot relate to it. Someone, someone has to be the last human on earth. Some generation has to be the last generation of humans on earth. Okay, I hope that sank into somebody's head out there. Someone has to be the last human on earth. Some generation has to be the last generation of humans on earth. Turns out that you say, I don't want to be the last human on earth. I don't want to be the last generation of humans on earth. That's so sad. That's so, you know, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be in that generation. You don't get to choose. Mother Nature gets to choose. She says, this is when everybody dies, every human dies, whatever. And you say, well, I don't be, want to be part of that generation. But look at it from another point of view now. What you're saying is, I want my son, my daughter, to be the last generation. Now, would you do that to your son, to your daughter? Do you love them that little to say, I want you to be the last one. I don't want to be the last one. That's terrible to have that thought. Or great grandson or great grandson say, I want him to be the last one and not me. Screw him. <laughs> So uh, by postponing, all you're saying is you want your granddaughter, your great granddaughter, or even your daughter, your son, whatever, to die in the la as, a, as part of the last generation, not you. You know, it used to be that the captain sank with a ship and they had to take it and you had to accept that. And you're saying, no, no, I'm not going to die with my ship. I'm going to let the crew die, but I'm going to try to save my buns. That's what you're saying. So think about that as well. You know, nobody wants to be part of the last generation, but we don't get to choose. It's Mother Nature that gets to choose, okay? And uh, anyways, uh, keep that in mind. You know, roll it around your brain a little bit. Okay, so um, Carl says the honest question is, how much time do the IU have on the clock? Our bodies will not live to see the extinction of man. Well, that depends. You know, I mean, are we talking about the doomsday clock? Doomsday clock is the clock where, you know, it's ticking because sometimes we get close to throwing those nuclear weapons. That's the doomsday clock. And the other option is what I had proposed is that the eco pyramid, ecological pyramid overturn, you know, and so one of those two will certainly guarantee our extinction. Now, let's look at the doomsday clock. OK, um, if someone throws the nuclear weapon tomorrow here, I've got it illustrated here. Here we have three gangs, three uh, gangsters, three mafias, okay, the United States, Russia, and China. These are the power brokers today, okay? So they decide to throw the weapons at each other. You might say, well, they might throw only one. Well, what if they throw more than one, <laughs> okay? They throw more than one, and they, we have, a, you know, fireworks out there, right? Well, yeah, if they throw one, I'm sure that's not going to stop there. It's probably going to be the end of the world, not only because of the effect of the bombs, but because of... Um, of what it causes to uh, the economy. You know, it's going to destroy any economy, irrespective of the damage done by the bombs. So if, if anyone throws a bomb, I think it's the end of the world. If they decide, someone decides to press that red button, that's it. And lately, you know, they've been uh, talking about that. You know, Russians have mentioned it apparently a couple times that they're not going to allow their government to fall. Before it falls, they might use that option of pressing the red button. And if they press the red button, I'm not sure how anyone's going to stop this. So how soon can uh, humanity disappear? Can, um, are, are we the last generation? Is it that soon? Will any of us see the last human on Earth or, or be part of the last generation of humans on Earth? Well, we can solve that very easily. If tomorrow someone presses the red button, we've only got weeks, maybe months at most to live. Most of us and whatever's left will live out their lives and that'll be the end of them. So, yeah, uh, the possibility is certainly there. The probability of that happening, that's a separate issue. You know, what are the probabilities of those things occurring? Well, everybody's got their own opinion about that. Maybe these people are just saber rattling to get to the negotiation table and they want to have a good position in the negotiation negotiation table. And they're just going to go in there and say, look, if you don't do this, I'm going to throw the bomb. And so it's just a threat but without any teeth behind it. But if they do throw a bomb, one bomb, just one, that's it. I think that's the end of it because then I don't know why anyone would stop, okay? I mean, here you kill 100,000 people with a bomb because you threw it on a, you know, some uh, military group out there. 
that's the end of it because they're not going to stop there. They're just going to be throwing bombs each way. And then you have also what the Russians said the other day that, you know, they might adopt the U.S. Uh, government's uh, philosophy that maybe what they need to do is a preemptive strike, meaning they would throw, I don't know, maybe half their nuclear weapons all of a sudden and destroy the other side before it can throw its bombs to this side. So all these gangs, you know, they, they do all these things, these mafias, you know, they, they might decide to press those buttons. If they do, it's the end of all of us. It's the end of all of us, not because uh, we destroyed everything. It's not because, you know, that some people have this idea that, especially military, that a nuclear war is still winnable. No, it's not winnable because whatever survives is not going to recover from the economic collapse. It's the economic collapse that's going to kill us all. The nuclear weapon is just, uh, you know, like a preamble, an introduction to the collapse of humanity. And if a nuclear war doesn't uh, occur, uh, we still are facing economic collapse. I mean, I'm not sure we anyone can avoid that. Not, not a single politician or econom economist on Earth can avoid that fate. And so all I can tell you is that we're doomed one way or another. How much time? Well, this, <laughs> this is my crystal ball, okay? That's the one I you know, rub. But um, that's about as close as it gets. I can't tell you for, for a fact that it's accurate. I, I use it for, to drink mate, <laughs> my, the tea that we drink. Uh, so no, I cannot tell you when it's gonna happen. All I can tell you is it's gonna be soon, whatever soon means to you. And when, not if, but when it happens, if you happen to be around, you're gonna be part of that last generation and there's nothing you can do about it.